Everybody listen up. This is everyone's worst nightmare, me with the microphone. So I'm going to keep this brief. Everybody quiet, please. Um, there are many great things about this school. Um, Mr. Stevens talked about the other day in assembly, being respectful and to our subs. We have amazing people that come and, and sub and cover our classes for us, um, be it retired pilots, be it retired professors. Um, but we also have a lot of special people that you guys don't know about. They might be alums, or in this case, parents. And um, I subscribe, like all of you do, to National Geographic. And a couple weeks ago, I got this issue and I noticed the cover story, which I was familiar with that story, um, that I'll let Mr. Huckley talk about a little bit here. But then I opened it up and started looking at the art in the, uh, the cover article, and I said, hey, that's Rising's dad. Um, you gotta get him to come up here and talk to us. And um, so it's really cool that we have a school like this where we have special people that we might not know exist. We all know Rising's special if you've ever met Rising. But um, when you know that his parents are both artists, it makes a lot more sense. So, so we're gonna let Rising briefly introduce his dad, and um, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about some serious things here. We're talking about slavery, and um, something that eighth graders, you, you have been there and, and studied that in seventh grade, seventh graders, that's what we're talking about all year, fifth graders. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about it, so. Um, Rising, introduce your dad. This is Cedric Huckabee. Um, you're an artist, but you also work for UTA, and so you kind of works two jobs. Uh, he has exhibitions, uh, he, or he's had exhibitions in American Embassy in uh, Namibia, uh, Amon Carter Museum of American Art, Art Institute of Chicago, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, Yale University. You graduated from Yale. Got your master's degree in art. Uh, art gallery, uh, Yale University Art Gallery, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, and you're married to Leticia, which is also an artist, and you're the parents of three children. First time for me having my son introduce me. Um, well, it's a pleasure to uh, come up and do this talk, and I thought, um, I have the, the book here that Mr. Stevens is talking about, because I'll have to look in it to reference certain things, but I thought what I would do first is give a little, a, a few images to show some background on the work that I do, and then I can take you to the article and all about it and how I got involved with that. Um, and this first image, I'm going to have to apologize for because it's, it's going to be the worst one. I just kind of threw it in here. But um, let's see. So this is a large sort of family portrait that I did some years ago. And the pieces are about eight feet tall, about six feet wide. And you notice how they're clustered together. It's a family portrait. And I do a lot of um, paintings and drawings that deal with family. And this piece worked, wasn't quite complete. That's the head that you just saw in the family portrait. Um, it's closer to size there. Uh, the, the portraits are pretty large. And here's another one. Uh, and you can see the way that I handle paint. And um, this is uh, the kind of mark making, the kind of it's sort of gestural, expressionistic. And that's my style of working. And it's sort of how I kind of gained the name in the art world is through uh, the, the type of painting that I do. And often, um, I've dealt with families, doing portraits of families in sort of these unique ways. This is a family portrait. Um, portraits called Sonadores, meaning the, the dreamers. And it's just a beautiful portrait of this family, but done in this sort of way where the pieces are collaged or um, put together in that way. There's a detail of their style. So um, that's a little bit about it. I love family. I like discussing family, uh, the African American family, and its history, and heritage. Um, and so then there's the how did I end up doing these um, pieces for the National Geographic? Well, they um, 
they heard about my work somewhere, and they heard about the fact that I like uh, dealing with families and dealing with heritage, and so they contacted me about it. And um, this uh, piece on the cover is by Kadir Nelson, which is a, um, a pretty famous illustrator out there. Um, this was an issue that they were creating for Black History Month. And inside the issue, um, they came to me with the story of the Clotilda. And May of 2019, they had done a story on the discovery of the last known slave ship to bring slaves into the US. It was embedded um, beside, I forgot the, the, the name of the river there in Mobile, Alabama. But it was embedded in the river, on side of the river. And uh, to give a little backstory here, this is, um, this is the path that the ship uh, took uh, from Mobile to um, this place in Africa. Um, and the, the red line is there, I mean the white line is there, and the red line shows the return of this trip. It took six weeks to do, to make this trip. And uh, this transatlantic, what they call transatlantic slave trade was outlawed at this time. When the gentleman went to get this group of slaves, it was outlawed for, uh, since maybe 1850, it was about 1860 when they made this trip. So this was a, a, an illegal thing that the transatlantic slave trade was outlawed, but slavery wasn't outlawed at that time. Um, this is the diagram of the ship itself uh, called the Clotilda. And what you, you'll see are how all of the people are sort of packed into the bottom of the ship. And this, um, a perilous journey, is kind of a small term to describe being packed in a boat, and the the um, the kind of situation that these the captive must have lived through crossing that uh, it wasn't sanitary, um, smelled really bad, and two people died on this trip. There was 110 people um, that were on this Clotilda, um, but they finally made it. And as the story goes. Um, this, the boat was embedded on this, what you see right here in the di diagram. Let's see. Um, it's sort of like the spleen, the boat. And they found the boat sort of, it had sunk in the river, um, on side the river. And when the tides were low, you could kind of see parts and bits of it sticking up in the river. And this community that lived there, this community is called Africa Town. And the community was actually created from the former slaves. This group of slaves who rode, um, and here's some other images of some of the, um, uh, the debris from that ship. The, the group um, from who came to the US on the Clotilda, they actually five years later were set free um, after the, um, the Revolutionary War. So they weren't slaves for that long. Now, slavery had been going on for 200 years or so. So this group were only slaves for about five years before they were free. And the group had spent, um, although they spent time, you know, like all of the other slaves in slavery, um, they were a real courageous group. And when they got free, they decided to get together, pull their money together, and um, purchase them a way back to Africa. Well, nobody would take them back. And so they fought for their right in court to purchase the land that they were on and they wanted. And so they purchased this area and it was called Africa Town. Uh, this gentleman here is Cujo Lewis. He was one of the slaves brought over uh, on the Clotilda. Uh, this is an early photograph, forgot when it was taken. Um, but Cujo eventually uh, set free and he was one of the ones in my illustration. So when they contacted me, I did a number of drawings uh, just to describe the process. I created a drawing for them. I created a uh, painting. And I created one of the pieces on wood. This is an example of one of the paintings I created. I wanted to see what kind of imagery they, that they thought would be best for um, their story. And what I was gonna be doing is they hired me to do recreations 
of some of the former slaves um, because they had pictures of their descendants and they wanted to do stories about the former slaves who were freed from the journey and pictures of their descendants. Um, and so I had a few really old photographs and some um, char old charcoal drawings that were done of the former slaves. And so this is an example of a painting that I showed them. I created a painting of, of uh, Kujo. And, um, but they chose the works that I did on wood. And I created those works on wood for a number of reasons, but mainly I felt like the wood sort of uh, spoke to the ship and that crushed ship that was um, the Clotilda. But it also uh, speaks to a number of different things. For example, um, there's a number of realistic paintings that actually go back about 2,000 years that were done in Egypt on wood, wood panels. And so uh, this is one of the uh, illustrations of uh, Cujo Lewis. And in the article, you will see the, uh, those illustrations or paintings next to the living descendants from uh, who are there today, who live in Africa town today. And here's another descendant of Cujo uh, Lewis, which is uh, Anna Maria. This is uh, Paul E. Uh, he's one of the uh, people, some, somebody asked me why the, they were wearing suits. And they were wearing suits because um, when they got free, one of the things that you know they learned to do was dress up just like everybody else in suits. Um, and so here's a picture of Paul e. Allen and um, Renetta Henson, his great great granddaughter, who's there today, and so one of the situations with this, um, with the situ, uh, and and these are just descendants, and I'll show you some of the descendants and some of the uh, illustrations from the uh, magazine story. Uh, this is Charlie Lewis, and uh, Charlie Lewis. There's a quarter um, or an area. It's called Lewis Porters in Africa Town, and um, Charlie Lewis was the one who sort of founded that area. So the slaves banded together. They purchased this land because they couldn't get back. They were wanting to get back to Africa, couldn't get back to Africa. So they purchased the land that they were on. It started off about 15,000 people. Uh, today, there's about 2,000 people. So over time, the number of people in this community dwindled down about 2,000, and these are some of the residents that live there today. And what has happened is an interesting thing. It's kind of a, um, here's another, uh, another descendant of Charlie Lewis. Um, what happened was that large industries had built up near the area. Um, paper making industries, uh, different ones. Um, this is Asakibi, and um, this is Asakibi and his uh, uh, descendant, um, Carlise Hin Hin Um Large industries had built up in the community, and it kind of encroached on the community. And it really, uh, even today, there's a lot of um, uh, health problems because of the industry. The industry came sort of, you know, bringing jobs and to say, but uh, the community now is sort of looking to bring in uh, income uh, into the area a different way through, uh, perhaps through um, um, I want to say uh, through their, uh, their legacy uh, in the area. They want to create a place where they can create a museum, where they can create water, a water park near the river, and where they can restore this community because they realize, and they have said all of this time that um, there's a lot of value to their community. And um, it's, a, it's a weird thing. 
I mean, if you think about it, the weirdest thing I found in the whole story is that um, some of the large industry in the area is owned by um, the former slave masters. And the area is owned by the former slaves. And so the industry that, um, what the industry is looking to do in this area is create an industrial, uh, a large industrial area that goes right through Africa town. And they want to bring more industry in. But Africa town is looking to create tourism. And they believe that this place uh, is a special place in the US because it's connection to legacy and history. So as an artist, when they came to me with this project, naturally I thought, I want to do that. I, I love to make those illustrations. But from my point of view as an artist, so I create paintings, sell the portraits. But I also do something called social engagement. And that's where you um, can engage a specific community with art. And so for me, the portraits was a start, not a finish. And my question as a social engagement artist is, how can I help? That was the question when I, you know, you want me to do the illustration? Okay, well, I think I could help with that. National Geographic sort of has given some light to this community, but what does the community want? Can I help as an artist? Well, this is what I would say to that. These are a few pieces that I did with a project called Dialogue with the Unknown People with Eamon Carter. In their archive, they had old um, historic photographs like the ones I was working with, um, or the images that I was working with with this project. And just like in that project, you had the, these uh, images of newer, younger people. And I think I can help them to tell their story. So now what I'm looking to do is have discussions with this community so that I can give light to their story and help this story be told and really <coughs> help to um, solidify the kind of legacy they have. This ship was a big part of that. I mean, it, it, you know, this is a historical find and they're looking to bring in uh, maybe create a, a um, I forgot what they call it, uh, a, uh, not a sculpture park, but uh, a memorial for slave ships. And they're looking to build a museum and they're looking to do a lot of things. Well, I think that the visibility that can come through art would be a big help. But also, um, maybe some of the revenues from that art would be a big help as well. So. That's, that's the whole story. And, um, and you know, that's, that's my engagement in it. And, um, and pretty much, that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
take it to the bank. Different amounts of time. So the the work for this uh, Clotilda project. Um, sorry. <coughs> The work for this Clotilda project actually happened pretty fast, um, but paint can take anywhere from weeks to years. It just depends on what you're doing and, uh, and how fast you can resolve a particular piece. I find that um, it's kind of, resolving a piece can be tricky. It's not just making something look real. Um, it's about making it have the greatest possible um, poetic power that it can have. And, uh, and sometimes that's not, it's not a, a sense of doing more. Sometimes it can be a matter of doing less, but you have to wait to see if less is enough. So. So I think I work everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing. I, so I have a studio at um, UTA where I teach a small one. Um, there is a small studio at home, but I hadn't worked at home for quite a while. Um, there's a house project that I'm working on um, in Fort Worth, and it's a sort of entire house that is a art project. And then um, I have a, a studio that's um, basically the, the, the old house we used to live in, which was where my first studio was, is, is now just studio space. Wasn't the house project featured in something recently? I know mean, it's It was, um, there was an article in, um, <coughs> I don't forget the name of the periodical, but uh, this it was. Um, some of y'all may have seen it. Yes. How do I decide what I'm going to do next, or what I'm going to paint? Um, well, it's it's not that hard now. Uh, it's deciding, and, and it is. It's just that it's a decision on what to do, because there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, and uh, so, a lot of projects present themselves, 
Some of them, like for instance, his work with Africa Town. When I when I decided to do uh, those images for the magazine, and I started looking into the lives and looking into the people, then I knew that um, I had to go deeper. Um, and there's a number of things that are like that. Right now, um, there's this project that I'm dealing with. Um, they invited me to Oklahoma to do another project that deals with um, the, um, we call them the uh, race riots in Oklahoma. Um, also. Um, and there's, the, um, I'm working on a house here. I've been working on that for about six years. Um, and, you know, there's a number of things. So the, the deal is not how to come up with ideas, it's which one to work on and what to, you know, decide not to work on. Um. Okay, one more question here. Go ahead. How many do you work on at once? Uh, so I work on a lot of things at once. There's a, a, a lot of things going on. So, for instance, right now, there's a public art project that I'm doing, and it takes a long time to do those. There's a lot of back and forth between the city of Fort Worth, between um, uh, fabricators and stuff like that. So that's been sort of ongoing for, for years, a number of years. There is, uh, I'm working on a, the, the house project that we just described, uh, that I just described. But then at the same time, you know, I can work on a project like that project of the Platilda and, um, and other pieces. I just finished a large, um, a 20 foot wide um, piece of portraits that are clustered together. And so th there's uh, a number of things that happen at once. I don't wanna say one time, but things overlap and then something goes away and other stuff sort of comes in its place. And, um, and so I find myself working on, I have about five projects going right now. Um, and they go at different paces. And I'm looking at what the next things might be when something loses its spot or gets completed. Then the next things are sort of already kind of set up and waiting to come through the door. I think we need to kind of get you guys back to class. Uh, so.